Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Friends, grace and peace to you, and welcome to online worship with First Presbyterian Church of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Claire, and I'm grateful to be joining with you in worship today. In in-person worship at both of our services, 9 o'clock and 1030, we'll have a special blessing for our students who are starting the new school year. So let's join our hearts in prayer as we pray for them. God of wisdom, we thank you for schools and classrooms and for the teachers and students who fill them each day. We thank you for this new beginning, for new books and new ideas. We thank you for iPads, for sharpened pencils, pointy crayons, and for lesson plans and playtime. We ask that you would bless all students with curiosity, understanding, and respect. May they remember each and every day that they are loved by you and they are loved by this church. May everyone who meets them think that they have met Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's gather our hearts for worship. If God kept track of our sins, who would stand a chance? But there is forgiveness with our Lord. Trusting in the forgiveness, let us admit our brokenness before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not lived as your faithful children. We've been angry with the world and we have held grudges against our adversaries. We've hoarded the fruits of our labors rather than sharing our bounty with those in need. We have not built up our neighbors with loving kindness, but have indulged in gossip and rumors. We have not forgiven the wrongs others have done, even though we desire your forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Heal us, God, and give us the grace to love as Christ loved us.
People of God, hope in the Lord. Faithful love is with the Lord. Great redemption is with our God. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, draw us into you and help us to hear your word of truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. King David. In worship three weeks ago, we heard the story of David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. Last week, we heard the story of the prophet Nathan confront David, and Nathan helps David recognize his sin. David repents, but there are still consequences to his sin. Through Nathan, the Lord declares, The sword shall never depart from your house, and I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. Oh boy, there is trouble. The lectionary skips six chapters of the trouble within David's own house. The worst of the conflict starts when David's son Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar, David's daughter by another wife. David refuses to punish Amnon, and Absalom, Tamar's brother, becomes outraged. A couple years pass before Absalom avenges his sister. Absalom kills his half-brother Amnon at a feast. Absalom then flees into exile until King David is convinced to bring him back home. And David forgives Absalom. But Absalom begins promising the people that he will be a more just and righteous king than David. After a few years of strategic political campaigning, Absalom raises an army that forces King David to flee Jerusalem. To show he is now the real king, Absalom forces himself on ten of David's concubines in public for all to see, an event that was foreshadowed by the prophet Nathan in the text we heard last week. That's a brief summary of those six chapters that we are jumping over, and believe it or not, I've left out many of the twists and turns in the story, but I think it's a good enough summary before we pick up with today's reading. King David's military and Absalom's militia are engaged in battle. Listen for the word of the Lord. Then King David ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite messenger came to David, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord the king, for the Lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do harm to you be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oof. We have seen David grieve before. 
He grieves for the deaths of Saul and Jonathan. He grieves for the sickness and death of his son, the one he has with Bathsheba. He grieves for Amnon's death, but we have not seen grief like this. The grief is desperate and brokenhearted. This is the final story of King David in the lectionary. We leave David here in his raw grief. The next text reports on the death of King David in his old age and the crowning of the next king, Solomon, David's second son with Bathsheba. So we have now reached the end, the end of the lectionary readings on David and the end of our sermon series from 1st and 2nd Samuel. It doesn't end on a happy note, does it? It ends with a distraught king and broken-hearted father weeping over the death of his son. And we readers all know the sin and the violence and brokenness that got us to this point in the story. Maybe we can't help but wonder why? Why are these devastating stories included in our holy scripture? The gospel stories have mastered the happy ending with Christ who was crucified, died, and was buried, but on the third day he rose again. So why bother with this sad story? Why do we still pay attention to the Old Testament? Why are we reading these stories in worship? And why do we still teach them in Christian churches? We are not the first to have these kinds of questions. A well-known questioner from the church's early history was a man named Marcion. Marcion argued that the God of Jesus was an entirely different God from the God of the Old Testament. He saw one God as arbitrary, vindictive, and punishing, and the other as loving, compassionate, and forgiving. At this point in time, in the second century, there was no approved list of the New Testament. And so Marcion identified what he thought should be classified as true scripture. Marcion's Bible was limited to the epistles of Paul and the Gospel of Luke. He argued that the Old Testament should be completely abandoned by the Christian church. The Christian church, however, disagreed the church declared Marcion's teachings heresies, and they responded to his false teachings. The church at large began to compile a list of sacred Christian writings, and a consensus gradually developed, a general agreement as to the basic books to be included in Scripture, though it would take a couple more centuries before the New Testament was officially canonized. The larger Christian church upheld without question that Hebrew scripture was an essential part of the Christian canon. The early church held fast to the idea that the Hebrew Bible shows that God had been preparing the way for the advent of Christianity revealed in Jesus Christ. Christian faith is not faith in a different God. Christian faith was the fulfillment of the hope of Israel. The church also responded to the heresy of Marcionism with a creed, the first draft of what we now know as the Apostles' Creed. It was first put together in Rome around 150 AD, and it was called a symbol of the faith. The creed was a means whereby Christians could distinguish true believers from those who followed the various heresies. Affirming faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God means that Jesus is the son of the God who is ruling and has always rules, ruled over this world and over all reality. Knowing the story of Marcion is knowing part of the history and heritage of the Christian church. It's like knowing our genealogy, who came before us and how we got here. The story of Marcion is part of our family history. There are several TV shows about finding out a person's family history, shows that feature various celebrities in search of this, their personal stories and their personal genealogy. I watched an episode recently of the show, Who Do You Think You Are? with the actress and singer-songwriter Zoe Deschanel. Zoe's family always claimed that they came from a long line of strong women, but she didn't have the whole story. Zoe's journey of her geneal genealogical research brought her right here to Lancaster County, 
She learns a mix of troubling and exciting history. Her five times great-grandfather, Thomas Henderson, lived in Sadsbury Township and owned an enslaved person. And her four times great-grandmother, Sarah Henderson Pownall, was an active abolitionist and served an, on an anti-slavery committee right here in Lancaster. Sarah and her husband, Levi, allowed a man who escaped from slavery to live on their land in direct violation of the Federal Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. And for you local history buffs, Sarah's farm is a location of the Christiana resistance of 1851, an important event that led up to the Civil War. As Zoe learns her family history, she processes along the way. When she learned that her ancestor participated in and benefited from chattel slavery, she was honest. She did not like that revelation. And when she learned about another ancestor's activism and abolition, she named how proud she was and that she was inspired to encourage the next generation of strong women. Family stories are usually complicated histories, sometimes filled with moments of great pride and achievement, and sometimes messy, complicated, full of hurt. The same can be said about the stories in our Holy Scripture. Sometimes they tell stories of great accomplishments and triumph, and sometimes they are messy, complicated, and full of hurt. The stories in the Old Testament, the stories of King David, they are our stories. These are our stories of faith. These are stories of God and of God's people. Our faith tradition is built on these stories. It's important to know them, to know who we are. They are our stories of mistakes and doubt, our stories of loss and grief, our stories of grace and redemption, our stories of love and forgiveness. The stories in scripture deepen our understanding of who God is and what God has done. The Hebrew scriptures witness to Israel's faith in the God who liberated the people from Egypt, the God who called them into a covenant relationship, the God who gave them the law as a guide for doing God's will. And in and among all the hard stories that come along with David, God affirms his covenant promises. God promises David a dynasty, and then later prophets will take God's promise to David and develop the idea of the messianic hope that God will send a promised Messiah who will perfectly establish God's reign at the end of time. This is the context out of which Jesus emerged. Followers of Jesus believe that he is the promised Messiah from the line of David. Followers of Jesus believe that Jesus Christ fulfills the promises made by God. Our job is to know the stories of our faith, to know them and to share them even when they are messy, complicated, and full of hurt. And even more than knowing them, our job is to live them, to live as people of God's grace, complications and all. To God be the glory. Shut
Let us pray together. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of today, for fresh air and sunshine and summer breeze. We thank you for the moon and stars that decorate the night sky. We thank you for the symphony of praise performed by cicadas and songbirds. And we thank you for the many gifts of grace that flow into our lives when we enter the embrace of your love for your nearness in times of trouble, for your guidance in times of uncertainty, and for the promise of hope. We thank you too that you draw us into community with our fellow human beings. In this time of conflict in the world, bind us to one another and to you, that we may bear faithful witness to your love. Help us to care for others as you care for us, May the work we do in your name show those around us what is possible when people commit to working together for the common good. Loving Lord, we pray for our world marred by violence, arrogance, greed, and injustice. As we fight against racism, sexism, poverty, and every form of oppression, Remind us that the fight is not against people with whom we disagree. Our fight is against the powers and principalities that oppose your reign of justice and peace. Almighty God, ground us in your love and fill us with your spirit that we may see Christ's face in the face of every person we meet. When we are tempted to treat our neighbors as enemies, soften our hearts and move us to offer grace and compassion. Give us patience, perseverance, and hope as we join you in the work of building the kingdom of God. God of grace, you promise to be near to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. We bring before you our loved ones who are sick or recovering 
grieving or in pain. Comfort their spirits by your spirit and ease their sufferings with your healing mercies. Make us attentive to their needs and help us to share your loving presence. We thank you for the gift of the church community and for your calling to participate in your work in the world. We thank you for the gift of Holy Scripture and we thank you that you continue to speak to us through your spirit. Shape and mold us so that our whole lives become a loving response to your goodness. Hear our prayers for we ask them in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings. Calls me his own beautiful Savior. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah! Praise the one who set me free. It's grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living Lord Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Oh, your blurry body began to breathe out of the silence.
job is to know the stories of our faith, to know them and to live them, to live as people of God's grace, complications and all. Friends, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.